Thank you, Paul, for uh, coming on the podcast today. I appreciate you taking the time. You are well known uh, on Twitter and the internet as Lindy Man, and uh, love all the content that you've put out over the years. Big fan of the general perspective on the world. I find it to be very refreshing and uh, original and interesting, and just a great way to sort of filter your perspective and you know put a lens on on your vision of the world. So, uh, looking forward to diving into a bunch of this stuff. But uh, before we get started, I think a uh, interesting place to you know, sort of dive in would just be to describe or explain how you became the Lindy man, you know, you weren't born this way. So how'd you sort of come across this type of stuff and become, uh, you know, the Lindy man that you are today? Uh, I was a reply guy for Nassim Taleb for years. And, uh, uh, but I was also in other circles too, just like posting, like, uh, and, and uh, I don't know. I don't know how this happened. I think one day I just uh, decided to, to to take this heuristic, this Lindy effect heuristic, start posting about it, and then started posting about other things. And uh, and uh, you know, I, I I don't actually don't know like how you would how you would describe because uh, it's not like. You know, you go on TV or something, or somebody gives you a contract. You're just sort of just posting on Twitter, and at some point, more people follow you. And uh, so it's, so it's, you know, there's networks that retweet you, and um, but but it's just sort of just following this heuristic and developing other ideas that are kind of adjacent to this heuristic, um, and you know, the following emerged, I guess. So maybe a, a different way to sort of approach that is like, uh, you know, when you started on Twitter, like when was that? Were you always, you know, the handle Lindy man? Were you always into, you know, you got on Twitter and you started being like a reply guy for Nassim Taleb or, um, you know, how did all of this work in parallel to your traditional career? And have you sort of transitioned out of that towards doing this full time? The You know, maybe some answers to those questions might paint the picture a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was anonymous for a while, I guess. I remember 2015, 2016, just kind of observing and maybe replying a little bit. Um, and I think, I think once like 2017 or 18, maybe I started posting a little bit more. Um, and I decided to just, uh, post under my real name because, um, I, I, I guess I didn't, I didn't think, like, well, why not? Like, why not? I just sort of, like, like, I'm not posting anything crazy or or things that I feel like are, uh, uh, you know, that get you in trouble or something. Like, I guess I never had that kind of, because uh, you see people posting on Instagram, like, in their name all the time. And, and, and there's this real obsession on Twitter with being anonymous. And, uh, and I guess it works in a lot of aspects because it's, you know, you can say whatever you want when you're anonymous because there's no consequences. And um, I always felt like, you know, there should be a feedback loop a little bit for, you know, you post under your name. Um, and if you really want to post something, I guess, that uh, you feel maybe, maybe people may, you know, get mad about or something, you just maybe use a metaphor. Like you, there's these constraints on creativity that actually enhance the art so i always felt like well you know they'll just make me a better poster in the end if i just had these some certain constraints as well so i i uh i also felt like you're more real if you're just you're a person on there um so yeah i i, I and i and then i just started um you know developing like ideas based on my life like going to work and uh kind of you know, seeing the difference between someone who owns the business versus someone who works there and has to, one has to be consistent and the other one sort of has to be in payoff space and make, and make, uh, make decisions and their, their whole like lives are kind of different. And like, nobody's really talking about that. I sort of, there, that was the time when there was a lot of easy money on Twitter and like, this, you know, I guess all this sort of VC and startup and, this whole tech kind of movement where, you know, being a founder was applauded or, but, but, but there was nothing there for like being an employee or like there's, there seems like there was miss, something missing there that there's this whole like 
literature about being an employee and what it means. I call it the consistency space or the four hour life that like nobody was really talking about. They were just talking about, you know, owning and founding businesses. So that was just, you know, one thing I took from my normal kind of job. And, uh, and then there's the Lindy thing, which is, you know, we're living in America during like a hyper technological time, um, you know, surrounded by electronics and also social kind of changes that are happening, you know, a lot more atomization, a lot more, you know, people are dating through apps instead of, so even like in person or even through families and like, there's just, there's a large shift in, in how we live a little bit that's happening. Um, it's, it's pretty subtle though, I think, because, um, because, you know, we're just adjusting to it and generations are being born, you know, on the screen or on social media now. And so we've exited this 20th century media monoculture and we've sort of went into this new era. You know, the, this, and, you know, I grew up under this 20th century media monoculture. So, you know, I feel like you can see differences. And then, and then I started exploring, hey, wow, there's all these sequels. Uh, and music just seems repetitive. It seems like, and, and fashion changes happen. It hasn't been a change in fashion from like in the population in years and decades. And there was changes every decade through all these uh, mainstream routes. And so I developed like a step culture thesis of how, you know, we're, we're at the mainstream level, we're stuck, but at the internet level, there's lots of stuff going on, lots of innovation, but when you step outside, uh, it seems like there's been there, there's a large change in society than what it used to be, um, and then I started you know developing you know and th there's also there's also tons of tribes online, you know people telling you to eat certain things or take supplements or hacking the body or you know trying to create alternative money like Bitcoin and so you have this heuristic called the Lindy effect which is you know, there's a reason that tra tradition or certain things are, uh, certain things work and have, have lasted over time is because they're not harmful, or at least they work. And, and you can kind of explore this heuristic a little bit and, you know, analyze kind of emergent new technologies or ways of living and see if we're at a, uh, you know, if there's a big environmental change, like cigarettes is probably the obvious one right it came into the culture in like 1920s it's this really amazing kind of product uh i never you know that's easy to be you know to be addicted to you know i went for like 80 years and it just we just basically kicked it out like it caused a lot of people to die totally not lindy there's no precedent for human smoking like small amounts of tobacco every day constantly um <clears throat> so and also combining it with a sedentary life so um you can just use the past to sort of uh look at the future and see you know we're all kind of in this world testing these this new all these new objects right uh but which ones are sort of going to last and which one's harmful i think the heuristic is kind of a helpful north star for that uh but to tell you that like i i work Still, I, uh, yeah, I, um, you know, it allows me to be free in my writing. So I'm not like captured by my audience or I feel like I, I have to do things that I don't want to write about, you know, just having the optionality um, sort of helps me develop my ideas and be free in that domain. Because uh, if I wasn't, I'd have to kind of like ride different i don't know hype cycles or something or be really focused on making like a side gig kind of my main gig and and it just makes you more fragile to just have one source of income i prefer a few others uh and I, and, and but it also puts me in touch with reality which is like 90 to 95 percent of people are employees and you wouldn't know that on twitter because a lot of people on twitter are independently wealthy or their owners of businesses or you know, I call them payoff space members and you know they're giving advice which probably only 
applies to them and their position. Uh, so it actually helps me to sort of, uh, and there's like a long tradition of people having jobs and writing on the side. Um, you know, so long, long tradition. So I, I can kind of see why that is. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, uh, you know, you bring up a ton of topics that uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, but, um, you know, like the payoff space, consistency space, refinement culture, how culture is a bit stuck and a bunch of these things. Mm -hmm. But um, would love to start with Lindy. That's how I sort of, uh, you know, got to know you in the first place. And uh, one, you know, you sort of introduced it just to summarize, I guess, the way I think about it. And correct me if you have any sort of corrections, but Roughly, it says like the longer that something's been around, the longer it's likely to remain around. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. you know, when something comes in and it's pretty new, there's sort of a default skepticism about that because, you know, there is, it's not Lindy at all. It's brand new. And who's to say whether it's going to stay around for, you know, a couple more days or weeks or months or years or decades or centuries or whatever. And very few things stick very long, but those things that do or have historically are, you know, very Lindy. Um, so I think, you know, it'd be interesting to sort of, I, I think a lot about sort of like the fundamental aspects of life and, and we'll sort of, maybe we can take a Lindy lens on some of those things. You've got like the one Twitter account, Lindy diet, that is pretty interesting to me. Um, but before we do that, at sort of like a macro level, anything about Lindy and sort of, uh, you know, how to, how to think about it as sort of a, a law of nature or something like that. Um, do you think well, sort of one thing I, I wonder is basically is time consistent over time? And um, what I mean by that is, is something being around for, you know, one year now, does that give it a lot more credit than, you know, if it were to have been around for one year, you know, 200 years ago, or, you know, take, make it 10 years, 200 years ago versus 10 years today. Like, I think time seems to be moving faster in terms of uh, the velocity of change, just by the virtue of sort of technology. Um, things, you know, you used to be able to be born some number of years ago, and you could pretty reliably predict what the world would look like when you died. Like there wasn't that much that was going to be that different. Today, I really, you know, it's very difficult for me to say what the world's going to look like in, you know, 2080, um, because, you know, things just are changing all the time. Uh, and maybe not year over year, it doesn't seem like that big of a difference. But five years ago, a whole lot less people were working remotely. No one was really thinking about pandemics. AI wasn't really a thing other than like a, you know, hot buzzword or whatever. And uh, the world was quite different. So do you sort of assign, like, is it easier for something to become Lindy over a shorter period of time today? And do you sort of discount, you know, hundreds of years of Lindiness in the past versus, you know, 10 years of being around today? Um, the problem is, I don't know where we are in, in this cycle. So if this was 1960, we'd both be smoking a lot of cigarettes. And we wouldn't really know, you know, maybe we do know it's kind of bad for you, but, you know, cigarettes are going to be a part of the culture and they're not going away, right? Like, and I almost think that's where we are with a lot of these screens or a lot of, uh, or you can even, you know, we're just sort of smoking away with technology and just consuming tons of information on a daily basis. And um, that, I mean, I don't know where we are. Like if something comes, like, like for example, the car, car is uh, about 100 years old at this point, um, and it completely transformed the environment, right? I mean, it, you know, nothing, nothing like the car, like the car culture, what they call like suburbs and highways and transportation and, you know, living long distances away and how we interact with our neighbors. You know, this is a massive invention, but, uh, you know, they just came out with self-driving cars. You know, that's on the road in San Francisco. And is that going to replace the car? Like the car replaced the horse. And then does the self-driving car actually take us back to more of a, like, I guess a more of a Lindy kind of world where, Hey, that car is just driving around whenever I need it, you know, it'll be here. And I can now, you know, build housing or 
uh, engage with the community different, like maybe historic, more historically than I could now, which which is living in a world shaped by the personal car. Okay, so there's it's like everything's moving right now. Uh, inventions sometimes take us to new places, and other times inven inventions take us to um, places that we've come from. Um, like like Apple's releasing their new goggles. Well, if I just wear goggles every day, I don't have these like screens or laptops or computers or these or you know in my house. I can actually make my house look like a house a hundred years ago with you know nice furniture and you know once every technology entered the home as furniture you know um the stereo looked like furniture the tv you know wood paneling looked like furniture uh, and we just gave up and let technology kind of overtake the home and with these big black screens everywhere and does this you know do these these VR goggles, whatever you call them, does it is it going to is it going to transform the home back to something that it was before screens? Because um, then you just if you need to do your internet stuff, you just go and put on the goggles, and you go back to the real world. So uh, it, it's a it's tough determining the, you know where we are first of all, what effects these new technologies are going to have, and I don't really think in um, uh, yeah there's 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 an argument that time is speeding up uh, and that, and because there's so many people now have access to the same amount of information that, you know, a year, 500 years ago would, would not equal a year today. Uh, you know, I've heard that there's, there's, you know, it's just because of such the masses of people, so things are actually accelerating. Lindy's actually accelerating. Um, I've heard that argument too. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if that's sort of helpful because I think I think just using the heuristic by itself and literally is good enough uh, without sort of the speculation. Uh, and I think it can be really helpful to your day to day day to day life and um, without even having to go into those areas. Um, so. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I wasn't expecting necessarily like a definitive answer, or like, yes, that is the case, or no, that's not, or here's how much it is, or whatever. But I think it's an interesting question. And to your point, it doesn't change, you know, the thinking about things in terms of Lindy is still very useful, regardless of sort of the answer to that question. But I'll sort of present, you know, one thing, you know, obviously pretty popular that this might sort of impact and ask like sort of a relative question of how it could sort of impact your view. So, you know, take Bitcoin, right? Um, and take gold. Gold, like extremely Lindy. Bitcoin been around for, you know, uh, 14 years, something like that. And so in addition to the question of like, are those 14 years worth like as much as the first, you know, several hundred years of gold being around because the value of time is sort of different um, or you know, sort of the, yeah, basically the value of time is different, different. That's sort of one question. And then the other question is like, well, if time, if you're getting more sort of credit for hanging around per year or per decade now, than you might have for like a century in the past, then, you know, is there sort of like a threshold for these new things that do come in where beyond a certain threshold, you sort of have a pretty good idea that, you know, okay, at that point, like, even though this has only been 14 years or 20 years or 25 years or whatever it might be in the modern world, like that is now Lindy, like that has been long enough. And obviously for cigarettes, like, you know, they were around for decades, sort of, you know, went away for the most part, obviously uh, at least peaked, not Lindy. Um, but for something well, like- Well, I think we need, gener we need generational churn now. And I don't think you can- you can say anything without generational churn. It's like, hmm. it's like, I think a lot of the internet is going away. You know, we a lot of it has gone away. Like uh, your old Angel Fire, GeoCities, MySpace pages are gone. A lot of links to Wikipedia don't work anymore. Um, and now that those interest rates have risen, uh, you're seeing like announcements saying, uh, you know, Google's going to delete some old accounts. So we're not going to touch YouTube yet, but you know, YouTube's next. Old videos are next. Like it costs money to store all this stuff. 
and um and i and i and i think that um there's gonna be a mass deletion process happening very soon and there's something to the internet that's that 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 maybe has problems with preservation I and mean, we're still early we hasn't even been one ju- I haven't handed my computer off to my grandkids or something, right? And died and like see what they, see if they preserved it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're still early, but I think generational churn is very important because that's exactly how we have a lot of our intellectual works um, that have been preserved. So if you look at what well, why how, why do we have like Seneca's writings or all this, all this philosophy? Well, you know that was that was transcribed at that time. And there was bookstores, they read them. Okay. They died. Then there was like, you know, the church came in and said, you know, church held it and the church sort of, uh, transcribed it. And he's just this human process of, of preserving and trans and transferring is, uh, how we got those things. It's also how we know diets work. Like the Lindy diet is just, a religious diet that has been practiced by monks in uh, Christianity as monks, right? So you go to, go there and you eat this diet and you do, you know, you work all day and they actually live pretty long lives. And we know that, we have record of that. So I don't know what eating just keto does or just vegan. Now there are some Indian traditions that are vegetarian, but they've probably honed the amount of food or the type of nutrients in their food to be able to um, survive on that. Now, if I'm just some guy in New York going to Whole Foods as a vegan vegetarian, and I don't, I'm not part of some tradition, you know, I may then, you know, I may think, oh, now I'm have to get vitamins for, uh, for uh, a deficiency. Well, now I'm undergoing another non-Lindy thing, which is, you know, mega doses, daily mega doses of cement accident that um, you see reports how it fuels cancer a little bit. It was just generally pathways matter too. Um, so we just, we just need proof of some generational turn. I don't think we're there with the internet. We're not there with Bitcoin yet. Um, these are still early um, technologies, but we can make pretty good assumptions about other things though, you know, like exercise or, you know, um, attention or um, social trust. So uh, it works in many er- other areas, but I'd argue you can't really talk about it without generation churn. Right. No, that makes total sense. Uh, and hadn't really thought of it as like sort of that uh, deliberately, but that that uh does make sense so even if time is moving faster you sort of and you might sort of assign you know maybe a fewer number of generations is as meaningful as a much larger number of generations in the past but even still without one single generation churn at least you know let alone multiple it's pretty hard to you know be yeah, you know, right. have it's large just, confidence uh, that something's gonna stick around right and yeah i mean you know a lot of the Loeb Classical Library, you know, it's 2,000 years old. Um, you know, Stoicism is sort of a fad or something, but that is 2,000 years old that has been transmitted generationally and sort of read by a lot of people over history. And um, uh, so, yeah, we need at least one, I would say. So you, you brought up uh, Lindy Diet, and uh, you've got this, you know, Twitter account, uh, Lindy diet that has basically every day posts like today is a fast refrain from meat, dairy, and fish, or today is fast free, you know, no fasting restrictions. You're sort of celebrating, uh, with nice looking pictures (laughs) of these, uh, Lindy, Lindy foods and things like this. Um, what is, I'm assuming this is a diet that you're following, or at least mostly following. Um, it's not fasting as I sort of know it and that you're not fasting from everything. At least that's not the only way to fast. Um, can you sort of describe the diet? I know, like, I think you wrote breakfast is not Lindy. Um, <laughs> it, it sort of uh, matched a lot of, you know, I, I've been intermittent fasting now for, uh, I don't know, six, seven years, something like that. And one of the, it was one of the sort of the first levers that I pulled that helped me to, you know, improve my health. And um, I mostly just do, you know, stop eating after dinner and don't eat until lunch the next day. So it's like 16 hours or so, maybe a little more, a little less sometimes. Um, But I haven't really dabbled with like, you know, I think I did like one two day fast. Uh, I haven't really dabbled with like anything 
any regular long-term fasting or anything like that uh or any right. you know pescatarianism which i think is involved with what you're doing so if you could talk about sort of your primary principles the things you have like the highest conviction in from a lindy perspective and uh you know just how you go about it uh yeah i just adapted this religious diet it's uh in the greek orthodox what's orthodox pan-orthodox diet of um you know there's i think there's like 150 to 200 vegan days then there's like another 50 pescatarian days and you're in constant cycling of protein you're in constant cycling of um uh of fish and uh i don't know i i don't know why you know it, it meets the hallmark of what lindy is which is we have a test group of monks from a variety of cultures that have been engaging with this diet, you know, their test group. They do tend to have longer like, longevity than other people. Um, and uh, the mechanisms for why it works, I mean, I don't know, we're not, we're omnivores, so we're probably like, eating a steak every day is probably not Lindy. I don't know. If, I mean, there's probably some hunter gatherers, I guess the Maasai in Kenya or I guess there's these Alaskan Inuits that only eat fish. Like there's these outliers that have kind of extreme diets, but, um, but uh, you know, I, I guess the, the notion is too much protein, having too much protein every day might wreck your kidneys or deprivation is a good thing. Like I fast, I don't eat breakfast. Um, I do, I don't do a lot of long-term fasting. Like maybe I'll go a day or two every six months. Um, but you know, it's a very, it's a very helpful thing. Our bodies are not made for abundance. Our bodies are made for deprivation. They get stronger um, through deprivation, which is one of the problems with living our life today, which is you can have any delicious food we want. And, um, and, and, and food now is better than at any time in history. So it takes, it takes a lot of discipline um, to, you know, eat a certain way and not, um, I would say eat badly. Uh, and, and I think, you know, that that's probably in previous cultures, we've only been around a certain amount of food, like a certain cuisine that we've always eaten, uh, which is right now, especially if you're living in a place like America, you can have anything you want at any time. And, um, and I, I just generally think that that's not a way we've ever lived. Um, and that's probably going to get the regular person into trouble. Um, again, America's got really high obesity rate. Now they're trying to fix obesity with uh, some semiglitude. So these new uh, drugs that you inject. I actually tried it too, just to see if if it works. Because I'm, I'm, because I I, I uh, one I want to see if I want to invest in it. And number two, I trend, I generally like to do non lindy things just to see what it's like and if. If it might become lindy, or if or if it solves an issue, or if there's going to be side effects, so I just I tried it and I thought, oh wow, this is going to be really effective. It just makes you full all the time, but it's probably not the lindy way to lose weight. Like it's going to cause some side effect, and probably hasn't emerged what these side effects are at this point. But generally, just taking some drug to make you feel full all the time is uh, now it sounds great, and it's going to make a lot of money for a lot of people, but um, you know, it's a way to for us to find order in in a world without any structure, without any traditions, without any ways of eating. And you know, food in a way, food cults are have replaced religion in a lot of ways. Like you can tell almost tell a lot about someone's political affiliation by their diet. Like if they're into like keto carnivore, I might be more of a libertarian right wing guy. I mean, it, it associated itself with like Bitcoin and more of a masculine viewpoint if you and then and there's like vegan uh and vegetarianism which is become a little bit more feminine and liberal and uh because we live in a little bit of a post-religious world and humans you know engage with tribes everywhere so food tribes have sprung up and uh for me it's like well i look at that and i go i don't think any either of these are lindy you know where can i go uh what diet did we see generational churn do we see you know people not being harmed uh and you know i found this one and i just sort of i follow it i mean it's not 100 strictly but um 
it just gives me a little bit of a foundation to at least know that I'm not going to be caught up in some fad. And I go to the doctor and this particular diet that I'm on or lack of any diet, actually, lack of any structure is causing some health problems because our bodies are complex systems. And this is sort of the easiest way to, to integrate them into our life. Like, like the body, right? I mean, the body needs certain things and, you know, certain exercise every day, certain foods and liquids. And you can even say, I'm not going to eat or drink a liquid that's younger than 500 years. You can even say that and you'll probably be safer for that. Um, so, so yeah. Why does it work? I don't know. It, I don't have to, I don't have to know why I, I know it has and I know it won't harm you. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's an application that I utilize. And I'm sure there's other diets too. Um, it's not the only diet. There's lots of ways to eat that other cultures have developed. And, um, but generally this was, this was a diet kind of followed by Catholics before, ah, uh, I think before they reformed it in the fifties. Um, so it is, it does have a lot of use throughout the population. Yeah. It's interesting. I sort of wonder if, um, if there's any, you know, you're mentioning like the different cultures and the different diets, and this is one that was fairly widespread, but there's others and um, right. like more carnivore style or something like this. And uh, I wonder if almost for like a given person, it's worth considering your ancestry as far back as you could sort of look at it and what that means, like probabilistically about how far, you know, where you come from way, way back. And if that sort of could have an impact on, um, on how you think about some of these things, such as like diet, but, um, another, yeah. you know, r related to, uh, nutrition and, and, you know, diet more generally, you've got this really interesting theory on, on hydration, um, where I've sort of had this idea for a while that I, I don't really have great support for it. And, you know, I hesitate to just put out theories out there without much support, but it seems like maybe drinking a lot of water could just be like very underratedly good for you. A lot of people don't really pay attention to water. They don't talk about water really. They talk about fix your diet, exercise daily, eat your vegetables, sleep well. Right. No one really talks about water and it's like so fundamental. It's in every life form. And like, it's just how, I don't know how we sort of overlook it. Obviously people know it's not good to be like severely dehydrated, but it would seem to me that there is sort of like a right and a wrong range to be in for, how hydrated you are. And so basically you've sort of observed, which I think a lot of people would, will sort of resonate with that, that people today look a lot younger than, you know, they did 50 years ago, like a, a 50 year old today looks like as young or younger than like a 35 year old in the seventies or something like this. On average, people just are looking younger and it's kind of weird. And some people say maybe, well, you know, people are smoking less and exposed to people who smoke a lot less, maybe that's it. And sort of can just like have that as like kind of an easy answer, but maybe that's not the answer. And you sort of pose that maybe it's this like sort of step increase in the amount that people are drinking water. Can you talk a little bit about like sort of how you came to that theory and maybe describe parts of it that I, I didn't really effectively uh, summarize? Yeah. Uh, I think most people have noticed that watching older movies and it includes, I think, up to the 90s, too, in the 90s, where see somebody that's 21 or uh, 22, and they look they look like they're in the 30s or 40s. They just look older. Um, and there's like a famous YouTube video that says, no, no, it's actually hairstyles and uh, and um, clothes. It's, it's it, they're actually they don't actually look older. Like there's like there's like a there's like a quest to figure out this problem of why do people look older at the same age as we do now. Uh, and to me, it's very obvious. It's in the face. It's not just clothes and um, hairstyles. Like if you've just <laughs> seen a lot of pictures and I'm looking at a face of someone that's you know, a lot older than like 21 or 25 and, and just, just everybody kind of realizes this. It's one of those things where you bring it up and people, people are like, yeah, they know it is true. I've noticed that. And, um, and I, and I think, well, what happened, what, 25 years ago, 30 years ago? Well, we had like a hydration revolution. You know, we, water, <laughs> they started selling us water bottles. And started seeing people carry water bottles around. 
uh, and you know, drinking water everywhere. Um, and before that, yeah, you didn't drink water. Like if you ask, you have to ask your parents or grandparents or relatives if you're younger, but you just had like a sip at the fountain and maybe a glass at home, maybe that's it. Like you didn't drink water, like, you drink maybe a coffee, a juice, a milk, if that, but nobody's just drinking water. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, there was this hydration revolution where we're, we're being told, you know, we're being pushed, you know, that it's part of a broader health revolution with whole foods coming in and exercise and taking care of their health. And, you know, everybody, you know, everybody's an athlete and there's just a broader health revolution that happened that water was part of. And, um, and yeah, if you look at statistics and sales, you see like water bottles and then you had, you know, they, they made like permanent water bottles and people started drinking Gatorade like that, without sugar and, um, and everybody just starts drinking water all the time. You know, lots of water. I mean, I drink lots of water all day. I mean, I kind of cut it down a little bit actually, but, um, so I thought, well, this, and, and it's been, there's some studies, not a lot of studies that, you know, women have always drink water for skin health and, that's always been in that world for them. And um, there's some studies that say, you know, water's really good for you. Um, so why, why, why not water being the reason for why people look, uh, look look a lot younger? Because we've never, never just drank, you know, part of it's sedentary. So I'm sitting at a desk and I'm just taking water as I'm sitting at my desk all day. And, you know, if, every, if everybody's sort of in a sedentary lifestyle, that's easy to do. Um, so. Yeah, I thought I thought this would be as good explanation as any. Um, is it healthy or not? I don't know. I mean, you look younger. Does that mean is that good? I mean, I guess so. But what if you're constantly flushing your system and our our system wasn't meant to be constantly flushed all the time? Like, what if you know food deprivation is good for you, right? When you fast, it actually makes you stronger. Well, what if water deprivation has that effect a little bit? And we see some water fasting in like Judaism or Islam a little bit. Um, so I can't tell you if it's good for you, but it probably does have an effect. And maybe the effect is you just look younger. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is you, uh, by relying on sort of the Lindy lens, you sort it's sort of hard with like something new that gets introduced and you don't see a precedent for it in history and therefore it's not really you know it's not lindy and you you can't know whether it's going to be successful or not it's it's difficult to you're you're naturally going to be skeptical of sort of these new things and um i mean like you said you like to try these things and you know try to determine for yourself like is this going to be lindy you know is it really solving a problem whatever but it's right. sort of uh it, it would be very hard naturally to identify the rare thing that comes along that is actually sort of an improvement upon like history sort of where it's like this hasn't been tried before but this is genuinely good so for example for whatever reason you know maybe people historically and again you know we're not seeing pictures of people like way back when or whatever but we don't really we can't really look back and see like people drinking as much water as we are today and Granted, that's not really like a technology or anything like that, but it's just a sort of a matter, matter of circumstance. And like, maybe it is the case that drinking more than you're thirsty to drink, drinking, you know, three times as much as you would drink if you just drink it when you're thirsty or whatever, or drinking juice and coffee, maybe that actually is really good for you. Maybe that sort of adds five or 10, five or ten percent lifespan or whatever it is, and you know, makes you healthier longer and whatever, in addition to just having, you know, better looking skin or, or whatever it might be. It's just sort of hard to, um, you know, it's hard to know. But ultimately, uh, I guess you know, in life, you got to take some chances. Um, well, it's also it's also the first generation. Like, go back to generational churn. We haven't seen that first generation of you know hydrated people like me and you actually go to the end of our lifespan, um, like we did with cigarettes. Right? We saw a few generations of cigarettes. I think there was like two, maybe. And he's kind of like, okay, high cancer rates. This thing's going to kill you. Uh, not saying that drinking water is like cigarettes, but 
the, yeah, it, it is. It, the Lindy thing is just in your head and just sort of sparks thoughts about not only new products, but the scale and volume of even older products that um, like getting at an excessive level. So. You stay away from most prescription drugs. Like I know you've uh, talked about, you know, tea, deep Lindy, coffee, kind of Lindy, Adderall, not at all Lindy. Um, I sort of recently have, you know, quit caffeine, basically not necessarily just like a Lindy thing. Obviously caffeine is Lindy in a lot of ways, but um, sort of for a whole host of reasons, but I've always been very hesitant around things like Adderall where it's just like, you know, used to be kind of like a college thing you're cramming for finals and then like oh you know those same people who used it for finals are finding out you know it's pretty good for work yeah. that they don't particularly want to do and that they you know better they perform the more they get paid or whatever get promoted right. and then next thing you know you're taking Adderall for life um what are your thoughts on I guess you know Adderall but also just prescription drugs in general it's pretty hard for the, them to be Lindy at least most of them I would imagine um uh, are you do you generally lean towards you know not taking any or do you sort of think again you know there could be something in this category that's like well this isn't lindy at all but turns out you know three generations from now we realize like this one prescription medicine actually just like net better for you like there's no side effects it's just good uh, and it's very hard to know but it seems like a risky game to be playing basically yeah it's, it's always risky with things you have to take continually that that consistently cause damage or changes because if it's just one-offs i'm not really worried about that um because there's no real there's no real amount of damage that like one cigarette can do right it's just the problem with cigarettes is every day um and with drugs you might want that viewpoint which is if i'm just going to do this once um then it's, it's not a huge deal but if this is going to be part of my life every day it's going to start interacting it's like it's like they came out with uh this new study in aspirin where they're telling older people you know take an aspirin a day and uh, it's good for you and it's just i think i was reading about it last month about how you know there was all these like pro the body's like breaking down or some internal bleeding there's so, some problems with taking aspirin every day that they thought was harmless and it really wasn't there are complications that come up. So you always have to worry about drugs that you know you need to take every day. Uh, because I think that's where the real Lindy harm comes from. Um, but yeah, I mean I, I saw Adderall be a school drug for tests, and then it all of a sudden people are using it at work. And now all of a sudden ADHD is this kind of accepted uh this disease or condition and you know, yeah, Adderall's, you know, makes boring things interesting. <laughs> and a lot, 90% of what people do is probably not interesting at work. So, you know, it's it's a wonder drug for uh, people who are working every day or maybe who are a little bit scatterbrained and can't uh, hold down a job. I don't know. Um, and so I just saw that, like, with my eyes, just living over the years. Um, and then I think, like, Recently, Joe Biden administration freaked out because during COVID, you can get a prescription just by calling someone or an app and like it rose like 300 percent or something. And so they had a they ordered the um, FDA to or the CDC to sort of stop production and stop supplies. So actually trying to wean Americans off of Adderall. Um, and, and, and some people are freaking out. They're like, hey, I have a condition. This is my medication. You wouldn't do this with other drugs. And because um and you know we, we don't really know how to negotiate our sort of uh condition-based farm pharma-based society yet. so it's like it's like uh, marijuana is also another thing where it's like you know smoking marijuana every day um i guess that that's the issue with why, why it could be bad for you versus just once in a while and that's the problem you know because that's unprecedented in history you don't just see a society where people are smoking marijuana. And so, I mean, that's a new thing. And we're testing that out. Um, so that's, that's how I generally see pharma drugs, which is, uh, you know, be aware that if it's, if you had surgery and you take any you pain pills, that's fine, but getting addicted to pain pills is really issue is. So um, continual, continual use is where 
Um, that's what's the issue. With that being said, uh, you know, we're, we're the pharma nation, right? So people do a lot of drugs, and I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know what to think of that because um, you know, some people might need it to to, to function. Maybe there's an, there's an exercise issue. Maybe we, we need two to three hours of cardio a day, like like hunter gatherers or something, or people who walked around all day, and less some of these conditions would go away. Or maybe there's mental issues happening um, from living in this world. So it's kind of like a weird time. Uh, but for me, it's um, yeah, I, I tend to look at it as I don't want to live with a medication that I have to take every day. But if it's uh, one offs, then, then that's not an issue. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned, you know, maybe we need some more cardio. Maybe we should be walking around more, everything like that. You've, you know, become uh, well known for talking about the Lindy walk. I think uh, we have this in common. I Yesterday was a unusual day, but basically any call I can or any, you know, I do this podcast. So every time I'm preparing for a podcast, I'll listen to other people, you know, my guests that are coming on, I'll listen to them do other podcasts and sort of have like a, a handful of activities that, um, I know I can do walking just as well as, you know, sitting or standing or whatever. And then separately from that, you know, I might just walk to go to the store or walk for, you know, just walk to walk um, without any sort of activity that goes along with it. But basically I, f I find a lot of excuses to walk yesterday. I, I yeah. walked for like literally like four hours. Most people are like, what the hell? Like that's, that just doesn't like, they're like, what are you doing? Like that doesn't, that's not something that one does. Uh, but for me, it's like totally normal. And, and like, it's not four hours every day, but um, some days right. it's one hour or some days it's four. Um, I understand you walk a lot. I understand one of the things that you sort of do similarly to me is you find it to be one of the more reliable, if not the most reliable sort of ways that you can generate ideas. Like you just go for a walk and you just have ideas. That's just like sort of how it goes. And, and so, you know, most of writing or a lot of writing is, you know, dependent on having good ideas and thinking about things. And so walking is your like means to writing, I, th I think, in a lot of ways where you have these ideas, you write them down, and then later you sort of get to the computer and connect them and put out the piece or whatever it might be. Curious to hear sort of your habits around walking, if there's particular activities that you pair with it, maybe you don't do anything with it, you know, different times of day that you think about or taking new routes versus the same route or certain speeds or basically any little, little details about sort of your walking habit and how it's sort of been informed maybe by uh, the lindiness of, of walking and uh, yeah, things like that. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, walking, walking is great. Uh, it's where I generate my ideas. Like you said, I think I don't really think about things when I'm sitting down. I mean, I, I think movement in general is, uh, we haven't solved the exercise problem, right? Like we haven't, uh, like people go to the gym and they hate it. So like, I think there's like polls, like only like 20 to 30% of people actually work out a few hours, a few hours a week. And of those like 20 to 30%, like 10% don't hate it. And uh, I, I just, you know, walking both is a mental thing that makes me feel better, but it's also, uh, I pair it with bicycle riding and light jogging and some, some other activities as sort of a movement, um, my movement criteria. And um, yeah, I, I think we're just not moving enough. And that's where a lot of problems are coming from. And we haven't, as a society, solved that. Like you said, you walked for four hours, but like, I don't think you have a day job, right? And you're not in like a structure of a four hour life. It's just a space, you sort of, you're an independent person. So you can kind of create your own schedule and you can, do these things and i think um i think what's the real challenge is how to get someone into a more lindy lifestyle who actually has to work for a living who has to socialize maybe has a family has responsibilities so you only have a few hours left and you've been sedentary the whole day because you had to work and you know the uh i don't think we've solved that problem yet and i think it's sort of um a shame and uh you know remote work helps that you know, if it just allows you a little bit more flexibility in where to live and what kind of lifestyle you could have. And, you know, that's a great technology that can take you to more of a, more of a natural rate of movement. Hey, I think it uh, might've broken up. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you were, you left off, uh, you were saying, I think it might be a more natural way of movement, like the uh, remote work. Yeah, it's, it's a natural way of movement of, um, so, so the, the Lindy walk is just a random route that, um, there's no destination. Uh, and yeah, it's just lots of ideas come from, from that, you know, I feel better when I come back. I don't know. It's just, it sounds like very uh, simple stuff, but, um, Many people don't do it or they're in their environment where they can't do it or they don't have enough time to do it or they do it only on the weekends or, and, and, and I think of, um, you know, how we haven't solved the exercise problem as a society, whereas people hate exercising or they hate going to the gym or they, maybe they don't want to even go walk around or like, how are we going to solve this movement issue? Because if you look at cardiovascular rates, that's the biggest threat to our health. And if you look at you know, societies that move a lot, they have very low amounts of cardiovascular uh, illnesses. So um, I kind of, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to solve for that, but, um, and I think we're an impasse and I hope more, we become more of a health conscious society, uh, but that's an issue. But yeah, the Lindy walk is, is where I, movement is where I generate everything. And uh, I only try to be sedentary for a few hours. So. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing that's not Lindy is like uh, being at your computer on Zoom all day, uh, like, especially, you know, in video chat or whatever. And uh, I think, you know, I, I try, like I said, I, I default, if, if I have a call, it is default audio only, it is default, I am walking, like, and between the two of those, probably 90% of my overall calls, not including these podcasts, which, um, you know, can't really do while walking, but and I've, I've tried to actually solve that as well with like a mobile microphone or something. It's just not really, the quality is just not really there. Um, but right. for calls, like 90% of my, my calls literally, I would say are both walking and audio only. And I'll do, you know, if I need a screen share or something, I'll be on my computer, but rarely is that the case. And And for whatever reason with COVID, like in my old job, you know, we had tons of conference calls. They were all audio only maybe once in a while we do a video conference, but it's almost all audio only, even with like seven people on the line it was audio only work totally fine. A lot of people are on the call, you know, myself, I was like an analyst at an investment bank, sort of trying to, my job is like, listen on the call in case I'm needed, basically, but basically do nothing. So I'm like doing other work while I'm on this call that I couldn't have been doing if I was like on video the whole time. I just have this headphone in, I'm listening passively to this audio only call. And for whatever reason, we like defaulted to everything is going to be a video conference now when uh you know COVID hit and everyone went remote and to me it just seems so wrong like i don't know i just i think that's like the least lindy thing ever i don't know if it's going to stick around for a little bit but it just seems so dumb that we're sitting on these calls and like how you are as an employee is dependent on how good of eye contact you're keeping with the little camera at the top of your screen and like whether you're smiling and nodding your head Versus like, you don't even have to actually be listening. Someone could be pacing the room and actually listening far better and getting like a lot less credit. Cause it looks like what the hell is this guy doing? Like walking around the room while we're in this meeting. Um, so I've thought, you know, for people who are in the four hour life and, uh, you know, have a day job and, you know, have to sort of navigate the, uh, demands of that one interesting sort of ask I've thought about is just to ask your boss, you know, if you know, obviously if there's a screen share needed or I need to be on camera, I get it. But like, it's a huge priority for me to be able to walk during meetings, if at all possible, and to join audio only. And so like, you know, as uh, on the same level as like getting a promotion or a pay raise or something like that. So would love to sort of be able to default to that and, you know, join by video when necessary. And I wonder how people, you know, if they would be receptive to that, I'm not sure, but um, these, you know, you don't need to be be looking at someone, even if you're in person, you're not necessarily looking at someone when they're talking to you. A lot of great conversations happen when, you know, you're in the front seats of a car or, uh, you know, going for a walk or a run with someone side by side, there's no eye contact. You're just hearing it. So I think there actually counterintuitively is something like maybe a little bit Lindy about like having people in your ears with headphones or whatever, like that's not totally unprecedented. Um, so anyway, Big, big walking guy. Yeah, I think audio only. I mean, if you notice, phone calls are more intimate than video calls. There's something yep. with 
audio only that heightens something in our brain that lets the brain work with with this neg negative negative like space whereas the video and the image is sort of this overwhelming thing that kind of takes over the entire experience so yeah audio only is great because you know it's just um I'm, i almost think that uh i prefer yeah my work day to just be audio only because i think it actually enhances a lot of concentration it's one of those tricks that enhances concentration like yep um but but you no, know, that's the great part of re about remote work. It works like a window. So like the like most modern architecture is pretty bad. It's just they take, they're taking away uh, ornament and they're taking away angles and dimensions. But there is windows in modern architecture, and the windows bring in the sunlight and the trees and other fractal shapes. And it's the saving grace of modern architecture is the window that allows these lindy kind of shapes and these. And the sunlight to come into our house and i try to look at new technology as is this going to allow us to live a more lindy life and is this going to take away older technologies that maybe are not good for us like i don't think the cubicle the cubicle is a new technology and i don't know if that's if that's a you know it'd be nice if remote work kind of takes that away because i don't know if that's ne 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 necessary for people to be in every day so Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about environmental design and other contexts as well, like the benefits of, uh, you know, high ceilings and that it's somewhat arbitrary that we have all of our desks are facing walls because we have computers and the outlets are in the walls. And maybe that's the only reason. And actually, the desk should be sort of facing, you know, you should be facing the room or the door to the room or whatever. It's kind of a, a weird, arbitrary thing that we all line up with these, you know, facing the wall, which is sort of used to be a punishment that, you know, go sit there and look at right. the wall or whatever. Um, are there other sort of core, like obviously, you know, especially with remote work now, everyone, uh, you know, or even if you're in your office, whatever, you're lined up against the desk, desk and that's like a very fundamental thing. Like you're spending eight plus hours a day in that chair, looking at that wall. And that, that involves, you know, the seat that involves the looking at the wall, um, sort of a few sort of furniture choices or whatever there that are really defining how you're spending your day. Are there other things right. that are similarly fundamental that um, you've thought consciously about in terms of like environmental design? So I'll give you another one just as an example would be like, you know, your bed. Um, I actually looked into this a while ago. I, I sort of questioned, this was, I think, before I was familiar with Lindy, but I was like, I've sort of had, uh, you know, some chronic like back issues. And I'm like, why like what is the what's the deal with pillows like why are we using pillows are these like something that have a historical precedent and so i looked it up and like sure enough we actually have been using pillows for right. quite a long time <laughs> um but i was kind of surprised to find that so are there things that sort of in your life really? that you've like questioned and uh you know designed your environment a little bit differently uh yeah the desk thing was one um i mean that's that's sort of obvious like there's no depth Taking away somebody's depth and viewpoint is uh, uh, is punishment, right? Like that's prison, you know. And, and this sort of computer monitor is two D, and it's not providing depth. Right? It's like fake depth. It's not real depth. It's like it's it's not real. So I and the human, I think our animal brain doesn't doesn't see the computer monitor, you know, as like we see like a landscape or a view or you know. Uh, or room, you know, feet in front of us. So I think it does create sort of tension that maybe happens at a at a lower level. Um, so yeah, that that's one thing, and that's and that's because we've introduced a monitor uh, into our to our world, and the monitor we pretend the monitor is this, is this window. It's not, and now everybody faces like the wall, and it's like, ah, uh, yeah, it sucks. Um, some other things, you know, sometimes you'll look in history at like, and you'll see like some things that went away, but were used for a while, like the alcove, the, um, you know, this bed kind of by the window, uh, in the corner, instead of like putting the bed in the middle of the room, you put it into like a corner by, by the window and you build this little, you know, this cove, right? And um, and I was thinking, like, a lot of new apartments in these cities, like New York or D.C. or San Francisco, I mean, they're really small, right? They're meant for, like, one person. 
maybe they're meant for two at the most, but we're generally building small urban apartments now. And we're just totally giving up the bedroom for the bed because you can't really, it's awkward to do things around the bed. But if you do put the bed in sort of an alcove corner, uh, you will have the bedroom as a space to do things, a, a, to be usable instead of just having um, a living room kitchen combination in the front. So if you're working with 400 square feet, 600 square feet, 700 square feet, um, having that bedroom uh, be usable, uh, I mean, could be huge. Obviously, it doesn't matter if you're in a big house and suburbs and you just use another room. So, you know, I was looking at pictures of uh, alcoves and, of, uh, and, and saying, hey, this has worked for people before. Um, this could be something to be utilized uh, during new urbanism design in America. So you can look at things that have disappeared or are not in fashion anymore. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, another sort of fundamental category you've written about is uh, sort of, uh, you know, with with the shift to remote, you don't have these like, um, I forget which one it was actually, but you talk about like long range, medium range, close range conversations. And one of those ranges is like the sort of oh, talk yeah. that you have with like small talk with people in the office. And you found that like after some time out of the office, you're like sort of lost and that the like you sort of lost that ability, uh, which I think obviously a lot of people would sympathize with or empathize with. And uh, so there's, you know, these different types of relationships as defined by, you know, these long, medium range, close range conversations that you talked about, but then also there's the nature of relationships in and of themselves are changing quite a bit. And especially obviously the way people are meeting with this sudden shift to like, it was like the, the dating apps were becoming like very popular and everything. But then with COVID, it was just like, they became the thing. Like that's how people meet now for the most part. And um, right. do you have thoughts on sort of that as a historical, you know, in the historical context of how people used to meet and uh, you know, the tradition of marriage and, and thing and or even dating, maybe that's sort of even in, in and of itself, it's not that Lindy, I don't know. Um, thoughts on sort of where we are with that. Uh yeah, I talked about um yeah, I went back to the office to for you know to hang out and I didn't I didn't exercise that muscle of of that coworker relationship, which is which is not your family or your close friends, which you can say anything or uh, and it's not your acquaintance, like somebody you see in the neighborhood or at the store, and you kind of talk a little bit. Um, so, so, and you're in the workplace, you can't say something that could be potentially be uh, offensive, but you still have to kind of be a little funny and uh, warm. <laughs> so it is it's this muscle that once you take away and you get brought back into this world, and then there's hierarchies too, so you can't talk to someone completely like there's no higher, the hierarchies don't exist. And, you know, you're in a role and it's a whole thing that I felt. And you can only feel a lot of things once you've not, not been in it and take, you know, you take something away. That's when you know something's real. So yeah, remote work took away that, that uh, workplace chatter uh, that is different than acquaintance distance or family and friends distance, um, which, um, I mean, I don't really need that level, to be honest. But, um, but yeah, there was an effect there. Um, yeah, yeah. There's these big changes that happen, and there's I see that some other people have said the same thing. Um, I forgot what was the uh, end of your last question. Uh, just to speak on like sort of the this very unprecedented place where we're at now, where uh you know oh dating right yeah dating, people right? are meeting by the apps yeah, that's and it's just weird huge changes that's huge like i had to grow up you may have to grow up too to be able to approach a woman and in, in public and you know uh court her and you know and get her number and say something and kind of get to approach someone physically um and that's that was a change from before which was you know, your family meetings, you know, maybe some some close knit church or community or other uh, other type of institution. Now, courtships always kind of existed. Like if you look at the writings of Ovid or uh, with some other medieval writers who 
you know, people were seducing each other. That's, that's a long time. I and mean, that's happened a long time. And there's some liter there's old literature on that. That still actually works today. But, um, but for general, for the masses and for you know, coupling, uh, I went through, <laughs> I had to go through a time when I had to, you know, learn how to talk to a girl that I didn't know and kind of talk about topics and shared culture to now I have to optimize a dating profile. And what does that mean? Well, that, and what do I have to signal? Well, I got to put some travel photos. If I, you know, I, I got a signal that I, you know, I'm part of maybe a white collar class that I uh, am cultured. Maybe if I want to attract someone else who's maybe liberal or culture or worldly, or, or maybe I want to attract more of a conservative. And so I'll, I'll do my profile this other way, or like it's, it, there's a lot going on here. And then there's like the chatting, the text stuff, which is, you know, that's not a real life conversation. That's new too. So you're opt we used to optimize for something else. Now we're optimizing for this. It's all disarray. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, people find a way, right? Once you, people want to, people want, don't want to be alone. So, you know, it's, People are getting together, getting married still, but yeah, it's a time of uh, some pretty big changes. Um, I don't know if, if it's if we're leading to something else in the future, if this is just a temporary thing, or if this is how it's going to be now for a while, or it'll evolve. It's kind of it's kind of a new world. Once we sort of cut, uh, once what like 1950s, 60s, sort of, what's that sort of uh, traditional culture ended, and we started moving into a courtship, um, independent, everybody's independent kind of culture. Um, yeah, we've gone through some, a lot of swings. Um, and uh, yeah, who knows? I don't know. I mean, we're seeing a drop in, I think, weddings and also in um, children. So has, there's some effect, right? People are having less kids and people are marrying less. So, you know, there's a lot more single people today. So um, uh, it's a time of uh, change. Yeah, I sort of wonder with this, you know, you mentioned just how odd and seemingly arbitrary many of the aspects of the dating apps are and like, they've all sort of conformed. I know there's like slight differences between a few of the popular ones or whatever, but they're all basically the same thing. It's sort of what you described. And I wonder, you know, to, to our conversation earlier about like the audio only um, and, you know, something that might resemble more so going up to someone and striking a conversation or whatever very different than optimizing a profile and learning how to text or, or whatever that might be. Um, I've wondered like, you know, is there room for uh, a hugely sort of different version of a dating app that is like rethought from the ground up? So like one version could be you're sort of, you enter some information or whatever, and then the system sort of tries to match you with someone reasonably well. And uh, you end up like the first step instead of like, they're not looking at your profile. There's no swiping or anything like that you're actually just introduced to have maybe an audio only conversation, which like we said earlier is like, I think we both agree is actually much better in a lot of ways than a video conversation. And in this case, it's also preserving sort of instant judgments about someone's appearance and you sort of get to know the person a little bit by audio. And then if you sort of both opt in or whatever, you can, you know, maybe meet in person or whatever. And then it's like, it's kind of like a blind date, but you've talked and you can sort of you know, you see if you're attracted to the person, whatever it might be. And a lot of times maybe you aren't, but if you are like, that's kind of a much like deeper way to like sort of get introduced to someone, I feel like much, and it doesn't have to be like some like revolutionary deep conversation or whatever, but at least you're just like talking and you can like hear someone's voice and get a much better feel for them than text on a screen and like, you know, which parts of the world they've traveled to or whatever, what their dog looks like or whatever it might be. Yeah. It might, uh, it might be more of an indirect feature though, too. Like, you know, if someone like when you're on Twitter, you're reading someone's thoughts and, you know, that could be a dating app too, which is, Hey, I've been reading your thoughts for a while. Or here's a picture. So you post a picture randomly. I'm going to go in your DMS or even on LinkedIn, like these places that are meant for something else turn into dating apps, right? They're all mm. eventually turned into dating apps. So maybe the dating app isn't actually the dating app. It's some other app that has nothing to do with dating that becomes secretly a matchmaker type or or, or societally or, or or something we unlock with either like a twitter instagram where you know dating becomes like socially acceptable on there that maybe it isn't as now but could be that too but yeah 
man, I don't know. It's, it is, it is a time of a uh, change. It's uh, but yeah, I don't think we're in a refinement culture stage with dating apps. They're all the same thing. Um, they all look the same. And um, I don't think anybody's sort of brought on a new model yet. Yeah, maybe we can uh, wrap up by by talking a little bit about refinement culture. But before we do, I, I just one comment on your sort of, uh, you know, thinking of the dating app as like a feature rather than like an app in and of itself and potentially Twitter being yeah. an option. I've thought about this, like in the context of uh, like not not matching partners, like romantic partners, but, um, you know, friends, I think friends sort of making friends has undergone a similar increase in friction and change in the nature of how you make new friends as relationships have but you know romantic relationships but we sort of you know the dating apps were already around and they were just poised to, to blow up you sort of everyone needs like or you know you know need but it's sort of you know you prioritize getting into a relationship if you're not or meeting at least meeting people of the opposite sex if, if you're not meeting them and so that sort of needed to happen quickly friendships are sort of like maybe considered a little bit more of like an optional thing where like you sort of have old friends already maybe and like there's not like a dire need to necessarily like make new friends that's like immediately apparent like if you don't meet a new friend for a couple of years like that's kind of fine like if you as long as you already have like a friend or two or whatever um but i've thought of twitter in that context of like twitter seems like a great place i don't know about romantic partners because Frankly, it's just like a lot of men, uh, but and maybe, I mean, it, it could work as well. Uh, there are obviously women on Twitter and maybe it works, but for friend making, I, you know, I've met a lot of really awesome, like, yeah. sort of like, like-minded like people on yeah. Twitter. And I feel like they could easily introduce something that just, you know, they, they have nothing in the product currently that actually, you know, explicitly facilitates that like, Hey, here's this person, you know, you, you've been liking a lot of their posts, whatever turns out, you know, they live. 20 miles away from you or whatever you guys should meet up for coffee or, or like whatever i don't know what the exact mechanism is but something to explicitly make friends and i do think something like that for both friend making and dating is like super intriguing basically looking at these places where the internet can sort of like arrange you uh sort of by accident by virtue of sort of like what the product is rather than an explicit dating app that you go to meet someone you know what i mean yeah yeah uh i think I think explicit is uh, a, a romance killer, and I think uh, I think once you get into the world of seduction or of happenstance, or I mean, the real world is all about sort of random synchronicity. And uh, I think something that uh, can replicate the real world is probably better than literally a dating app, which is explicit. So, uh, yes. So uh, I know we're coming up on time and appreciate you uh, taking all the time, but uh, refinement culture is super interesting to me. This culture is stuck concept that you have 20th century media monoculture. Um, if you could sort of introduce that for people who aren't familiar and describe what you've noticed, what you think is going on, you know, why that might be happening. Uh, maybe we could just sort of wrap the conversation on on that topic because I think it's super interesting and it's hard not, it's, it's like hard to unsee once you've sort of thought about it a little bit. Yeah, it's it's just this flattening of this global aesthetics, uh, what I call the refinement culture, but also other stuff like even sports games, just a removal of diversity and heading, you know, and embracing some sort of optimal level. So every cars all look the same now. You know, a lot of new new apartments or new construction looks the same. Um, and like, like even with cars, we're removing colors. Like if you if you count, if you go on the road, you, you'll just mostly see gray, white, and black. Like and there used to be tons of other colors like 40, 50 years ago. And those have gradually dissipated. Um, but it's happening everywhere. Like like the NBA basketball is uh, is now optimized. So they the, the, the top 200 shots are either the three-point or layups. And this whole mid-game, uh, this mid-level game is gone because it's not as efficient. Uh, they brought in sort of data people to talk, you know, to to examine what is the most efficient way to play, and that's the most efficient w way to play. And you see this with other sports. This is the global removal of uh of diversity. Um, and you know, people have less accents than they did. Also, less regional accents. Uh, interiors look a little, you know, are more gray. Right, new new re renovations look 
the same. And um, I don't know why it's happening. I, uh, uh, I'm sure there's some sort of explanation around, you know, this is, this is a safe bet that the most amount of people would like to resale. Um, maybe there's some algorithms are pushing us that way. Um, but, but it is a lot of sameness going on, uh, and, and the world is becoming much more similar, um, as, as we're more connected, like I use, like I travel and when you travel, you'll see the baseball hat everywhere, but you won't see any, like any other hat, but go back a hundred years ago, there was like millions of hats total. And each region had a hat and they're all gone. So it seems like the more we're connected, the more diversity we lose. And I don't see a way out of this because I don't think anybody wants to really get disconnected. So um, yeah, it's just an interesting thing to examine, which is, you know, it's, look at how sane the world looks, like women's makeup or you know, Instagram models or internet apps web pages or, you know, Twitter clones. They have, there's like five Twitter clones. They look exactly like Twitter. Nobody else thought of to do anything different than just copy Twitter. And uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't really, it just seems like there's more connection. There's more, uh, we have problems with diversity. Yeah, it's, uh, it's weird. And it's, you know, other examples I think you've talked about, it's like, you know, we, we don't have like new fashion trends. We don't have new movies. Right. We don't have new music. It's just sequels. At the mainstream and level. Releases. Yeah. But at, at like, but that's a problem because like I can go on YouTube and there's a whole universe for me on YouTube or on Twitter or on Instagram, but we're not sharing this. This is my own personal consumption and we have trouble. If we don't have common culture, we can't share that with each other. I think after a while, um, the stuckness of common culture degrades and things get maybe a little weird. So, you know, there is an argument, though, that the 20th century was the non Lindy period. And we're going back to a more Lindy period of people in little tribes. And yeah, we're not consuming the same thing. We can't talk about the show we watched last night because we're watching way different things. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I think it's 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 another time we're entering. Um, it's kind of weird considering that I remember kind of the common culture that may not be as around anymore. So. Cool. Well, uh, again, appreciate you coming on and, and taking the time. It's been awesome talking with you. Uh, I'll wrap things there. I know uh, I've taken you know as much or more of your time than you had, so really appreciate yep. it. But um, where can people go to? Uh, you know, you want to send them to the Substack, or, or actually, it's not a Substack anymore, right? It's Beehive, I think. And, Beehive. Uh, just go to my Twitter, my name. You just go to my Twitter. It's fine. All right, and that's uh, at Lindy Man for people who uh, don't know. So awesome! Uh, thanks for thanks again for coming on, and uh, look forward to uh, keeping in touch. All right, thanks.